Hi everybody, it's John Farr back with our third installment of Virtual Classic Tuesdays brought to you by the Bedford Playhouse in beautiful Bedford, New York. Tonight we cover Tunes of Glory, directed by Ronald Neem and starring Alec Guinness and John Mills. You know, there's certain special movies out there that never quite get the attention and adulation they deserve. And I think Tunes of Glory is one such film. When it was released in 1960, it ran counter to what was in vogue at the time in Britain, which were those gritty black and white kitchen sink dramas of working class life. Movies like Look Back in Anger and Saturday Night and Sunday Morning that made stars out of Richard Burton and Albert Finney. Well, in the midst of all that, here was a military drama about an elite Scottish regiment shot in color, but set mostly indoors and without a single battle scene. Tunes of Glory began its life as the first novel of a 28-year-old Scotsman named James Kennaway. Kennaway had served in a Scottish regiment called the Gordon Highlanders and drew from his own experiences in crafting this tale of two diametrically different officers competing for the loyalty of their men. Now, Kennaway started adapting his book into a screenplay for Ealing Studios with Jack Hawkins slated to star as Jock Sinclair. Now, that would have been interesting. However, the studio had issues with his first draft, and by the time he came back with revisions, Hawkins was unavailable, and Ealing had basically lost interest. Enter Ronald Neem, who by this point in his career was an established director. He'd started out as a cinematographer, and then become a highly successful producer in partnership with David Lean, best remembered today as the director of Lawrence of Arabia. Ronald Neem was basically born into the film industry. His mother was a famous silent film actress named Ivy Close, and he got his first job at 18 working the camera for Alfred Hitchcock in a movie called Blackmail. You know, they used to say Hollywood was a small town, but it was immense compared to the British film industry of the time, which resembled a small, tight-knit club. Unlike Hollywood, where people might be working together for the first time on a given film, on Tunes of Glory, most everyone had a history together, in particular the major players. And the history that existed with Ronald Neem, Alec Guinness, and John Mills also had to include David Lean. First, Ronald Neem produced the film that put Alec Guinness on the map 15 years before, an adaptation of Charles Dickens' Great Expectations from 1946, directed by Lean. Great Expectations was the production that first paired John Mills and Alec Guinness. At that point, Mills, who was six years older than Guinness, was already an established star. Neem had first met Mills in 1942 while serving as cinematographer on Noel Coward's war drama In Which We Serve. Mills co-starred in that film, which also gave David Lean his first chance to direct. Up to that point, he'd been an editor. Anyhow, after the success of Great Expectations, David Lean and Ronald Neem decided to do another Dickens adaptation. Their Oliver Twist, released in 1948, featured Alec Guinness again as Fagin, unrecognizable in heavy makeup. Well, this role cemented Guinness's stardom and opened the doors to a series of classic comedies at Ealing Studios. Fast forward nearly a decade to 1958. Alec Guinness is at a career peak, having just won Best Actor at the Oscars for playing the upright Colonel Nicholson in David Lean's war epic, The Bridge on the River Kwai. He can now do most anything he wants, and what he wants is a change of pace. Now, by this point, Neem has been directing for about a decade. In fact, he'd already collaborated with Guinness on a rather tame comedy called The Promoter back in 1952. Now Guinness was reaching out to Neem about adapting a novel called The Horse's Mouth, a humorous tale about a highly eccentric painter. Neem knew the book already. Actor Claude Rains, best remembered as Captain Renault in Casablanca, had already approached him about doing a film adaptation. Well, Neem had passed on it, but now Alec wanted to play it and even do something he'd never done, which is write the screenplay. Well, with the great Alec Guinness so fully invested in the project, this time around, Ronald Neem said yes. The resulting film of The Horse's Mouth featured one of Guinness's most inspired performances and earned the actor an Oscar nomination for Best Screenplay. It would be actually the only screenplay credit he'd ever receive. Well, that production had been a happy experience that made its director and star want to work together again. 
So when Tunes of Glory entered Ronald Neem's orbit shortly thereafter, he loved the story. And at first thought, Guinness would be perfect for Colonel Barrow, the upper crust by the book officer. To his disappointment, Alec wasn't interested. It felt way too close to another Colonel he just played, Colonel Nicholson in Bridge on the River Kwai. However, if Ronnie would let him play the louder, showier role of Major Jock Sinclair, he would be all in. Now, Guinness would really be playing against type here, which was both a challenge and a risk. But Neem trusted his friend to the degree that if Guinness felt he could pull it off, that was good enough for him. A wise judgment. But now who to play Colonel Barrow? Alec Guinness didn't hesitate in answering. What about Johnny Mills? Well, Neem countered that Mills was known for playing lower deck characters, meaning working class types, to which Guinness responded in his deadpan way, but he is an actor after all. Well, he was indeed enjoying a busy career while watching his younger daughter, Haley Mills, become a child star. Well, when Neem reached out to him, Mills quickly accepted. He relished the chance to work once again with his old compatriots. The director then rounded out the mostly male cast with a fabulous group of character actors, including Dennis Price as Major Charles Scott and Gordon Jackson as Captain Jimmy Cairns. Back in the small world department, Dennis Price and Alec Guinness had co-starred in perhaps the best of all the Ealing comedies, 1949's Kind Hearts and Coronets. Price specialized in playing slightly blasé upper crust characters. And watching the film again, I was struck by how good he is in this. Gordon Jackson was a familiar, highly prolific actor who'd go on to appear in movies like The Great Escape and The Ip Ipcrest File. He'd also win an Emmy Award in 1976 for his role in the TV series Upstairs, Downstairs. Finally, Duncan McRae is memorable as Pipe Major McLean. Beyond his acting chores, he was assigned to instruct the cast on the proper etiquette for wearing a kilt, including not spreading one's legs too far apart while seated. To play Jock's former mistress, Mary, Neem cast Kay Walsh, a superb actress. She'd appeared with Guinness before in Oliver Twist and more recently in The Horse's Mouth. And she, Neem, and Guinness would also reunite 10 years later for the musical Scrooge, starring Albert Finney in the title role. Walsh also happened to be the ex-wife of David Lean. See what a small world this is? Finally, there was the key role of Jock Sinclair's daughter, and for this they chose an unknown 19-year-old actress named Susanna York. Later, she'd recall how quickly it all happened. She'd been summoned to London for a screen test and had run lines with Alec Guinness himself. He had gently counseled her not to push so hard. Returning home by train, she remembered staring out the window and saying to herself in shock and wonderment, I just performed a scene with Alec Guinness. Well, the actress quickly became a star, appearing in movies like Tom Jones and A Man for All Seasons. Now, the opening of the film depicts Stirling Castle, which was the headquarters of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. The original intent was to shoot within the castle. But when the regimental commander saw the cover of the Tunes of Glory paperback, with Jock's mistress sitting on his lap, he was deeply offended and withdrew his permission. Well, after much begging, he did allow Neem to shoot the exterior of the castle, but now sets would have to be used for interior scenes. Early on in the shooting schedule, Neem realized that John Mills' voice sounded a bit too soft. He asked Mills if he'd ever met Bernard Montgomery, one of the top generals of World War II. Well, Mills, in fact, had met him. Neem then suggested he build in some of Monty's voice and mannerisms into his performance. Mills was forever grateful for this piece of direction. Seen today, Tunes of Glory is a master class in screen acting. It's hard to overpraise Guinness's performance here. A contained, extremely private man, Alec Guinness once said of himself, flamboyance doesn't suit me, I enjoy being elusive. Though a gifted character actor, fully capable of disappearing into his various roles, he often played quiet, restrained characters more in tune with his own natural persona. With Jock Sinclair, this actor who usually avoided flamboyance had to be flamboyant in capital letters, and I think he brings it off flawlessly. In particular, the way he expresses his deep-seated irrational anger towards Barrow evokes the class resentment at the heart of the story. 
Essentially, Jock is a man who had to sweat and toil for his position. By contrast, Barrow's noble birth literally destines him for the rank and assignment he holds. So yes, Alec Guinness is amazing here, but John Mills is every bit as good in a part that's just as challenging. In portraying a man consumed with self-doubt as he confronts a job he's dreamed of having since childhood, it would have been easy to overdo his gradual disintegration, but Mills underplays it superbly. Really, the genius of the script lies in the fact that neither of the two central characters is completely good or evil. At various times, we like and dislike both of them. Ultimately, it's this prevailing shade of gray rather than black and white that makes Tunes of Glory so fascinating. On the film's release, Bosley Crowther in the New York Times praised the performances in the script, stating that, quote, this is a picture that gets around to saying some things about military traditions that haven't been said so aptly and eloquently for years, end quote. The British Academy of Film and Television Arts, known as BAFTA, nominated Tunes of Glory for Best Film, and Neem, Guinness, Mills, and Kennaway were also nominated for their contributions. Kennaway's script was also Oscar nominated. And at the Venice Film Festival, John Mills won the prestigious Volpe Cup for his performance. A decade later, Mills would win a Best Supporting Actor Oscar for his role in yet another David Lean film, Ryan's Daughter. Ronald Neem would continue working on and off for the next three decades. Having negotiated a piece of the profits for directing 1972's wildly successful The Poseidon Adventure, he never needed to worry about money again. Neem's son, Christopher, would also enter the family business, becoming a film producer, and Christopher's son, Gareth Neem, would do the same, producing a rather popular franchise called Downton Abbey. Finally, in 1977, Alec Guinness would find new fame and fortune playing Obi-Wan Kenobi in the original Star Wars, a film whose success he never fully understood. The money was very good, though. He took a lot more satisfaction in portraying spymaster George Smiley in two BBC miniseries, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy and Smiley's People. Next month, we will transition to a bi-monthly schedule, so we'll be doing these every other Tuesday. On May 12th, join me to discuss another classic screwball comedy, 1941's The Lady Eve, written and directed by Preston Sturgis, starring Barbara Stanwyck and Henry Fonda. Please mark your calendars. Till then, have fun and stay safe. It's John Farr. Well, here I am. Are we on? You are on. I am on. Wonderful. Hello, everybody. Um, I was watching myself. I, I was quite, uh, I, I thought I was terrific. God, I've said, no, I'm sorry. I sound like the president now. I beg your pardon. Um, I have a few questions here, and then I'm hoping that you all may have a few additional questions. Um, and I think the first one is fascinating. Um, and here, here it is. Although we are more or less led to sympathize with Alec Guinness's character and view, oh, I'm sorry, and view John Mills as a nitpicking prig, isn't Mills really the better soldier? Well, that's what I think is so fascinating about this movie, because I didn't really sympathize with Alec Guinness's character myself as much as I did with John Mills, his character. I feel terrible for this man. He's he's in an impossible position um, and he's ill-equipped to deal with it. So it's so funny the way a great movie can have so many prisms that that you can leave and somebody says, well, I felt for, you know, I was on his side and I was on the other guy's side. That's what's great about it when I talk about how there's no, there's no, neither of these men is evil. Um, they are in a situation that's extremely destructive. And it's, it's really a series of, of, of actions that escalate to a conclusion that nobody intends. So there's this nuance to it that I find very interesting. I actually, it's funny, because I always thought, oh yeah, Alec Guinness is so wonderful in this, but he's not, I don't really like his character very much. He's, he's, a, he's a bit of a blowhard and uh, uh, he's got a lot of anger, a lot of unresolved anger. And boy, does he direct it that this man 
uh, who um, is is going down. Now, you know, the whole thing is that Guinness's character can't see just how emotionally vulnerable Mills is because he seems like such a prig uh, and, and such a, you know, upper crust officer. But uh, that's why I think John Mills' performance is so good because you really do see all the way through that he's he's not comfortable, he's not uh, he's not having a good time, and it gets worse and worse. And the ending, which is so uh, for me at least, is very very bold. Doesn't come as a it, it comes as a shock, which it's intended to, but you believe it because he's been totally emasculated and humiliated and his position is untenable. So uh, that's a long way of answering it, but I honestly, this time out, certainly, I, I was more sympathetic to John Mills than I was to Alec. So it just so shows how you can see things differently. Um, okay, next question. Can you talk about Alec Guinness's character in Bridge on the River Kwai versus Tunes of Glory? Well. Yes, I mean, we've just seen Jock Sinclair. Uh, uh, Colonel Nicholson is basically a man who has to hold on to his officer's bearing and his discipline, ramrod, strict discipline, or he will go mad. So whereas Jock Sinclair is is a soldier of soldier in that, you know, he gets up in the morning with a hangover and knows how to salute, and 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 do his rounds he's he's still a man's man he likes to party he likes to have fun um he enjoys the camaraderie you don't sense that about colonel nicholson uh colonel nicholson is more like barrow which is exactly why alec guinness didn't want to do the part because he would have been repeating himself um and um so it's a very very different part and indeed as i think i mentioned in the talk and my talk is that Alec Guinness hadn't really played a part like this before. Um, this was not his persona. He tended to play very wily, quiet, um, contained uh, characters. And here's this big, you know, bluff Scotsman who likes to drink whiskey and cavort with the ladies. I mean, this was as far away from anything Alec Guinness had ever done as you can think of. And the fact that he does it so well and brings it off so well, well, he knew he could do it. And so did Ronald Neem. Ronald, like, Alec, you say you can do it? I trust you. You just had, you know, you just won an Oscar. So you can, you know, let's see what you can do. And of course he does, he does it very well. Um, so, but they are very, very different characters. I hope that answers the question. Uh, oh, now somebody admired the actor, John Fraser, who plays the pipesman, who's the boyfriend of Susanna York. Uh, and so now the question is, uh, what other movies was he in? I would remember, well, obviously he was not a very big star, but he did have a roughly five year period where he did some interesting films. In fact, he won an award that same year. His prior film was something called The Trials of Oscar Wilde, which is one of the first movies ever to talk about homosexuality. Uh, and it starred Peter Finch, who was a network. It starred Peter Finch as Oscar Wilde. And Fraser plays Lord Alfred Douglas. Rather different part from what he, what he is here. But obviously he was a very handsome guy. And uh, so that, so he had a big, he was like the big hope in 1960. And then he was in um, El Cid, which is a very good gladiator uh, picture with Charles Neston and Sophia Loren the following year. And then his big year was 65, that was his peak. Uh, and he did two movies that year that, uh, that I really recommend. One is called Operation Crossbow, which nobody knows. It's a war picture uh, with George Papard and Sophia Loren is the star, but she's on screen for about 15 minutes. But it's a, good, it's a very good movie, Trevor Howard's in it. And then um, the more famous movie uh, and role is he's in Repulsion. And I'm, some of you may remember that movie. It was Roman Polanski's first English language film, and it's a twisted movie. Uh, Catherine Deneuve plays this very repressed woman who's having a psychotic break, and she kills all sorts of people. I mean, it's it's great. I love the movie, but it's dark. So he was in that. I'm sure he was a, a victim. I'm trying to remember his his character in that. But yeah, that is 
John Fraser, and he is still alive. Uh, he's still with us, and he's uh, he's going to be turning 90 next year. So that's John Fraser. And so now, if there are any other questions, I've yes, taken. There are. We have a couple of questions that have been submitted. Uh, the first one. Uh, what about the psychological slash psychiatric implications of the film? Uh, uh, Sinclair has anger issues and Mills is obviously vulnerable. Can the film be viewed as a look at male stereotypes, i.e. the military and deep psychological disorders with the notion, with the follow-up that the damage that a sense of honor, quote unquote honor, can do to a person? Damn, that's deep. Um... Do you, uh, do you remember when Colonel Barrow talks about basically being waterboarded? So these are both men who have seen combat. Um, and, and Major Jock Sinclair was decorated for it, came up through the ranks for it. Um, Mills was gonna get there anyway, but he too has suffered. He was taken as a prisoner of war. Um, so you're dealing with two characters who've seen that. Uh, from different angles. Uh, Sinclair kind of glories in it. Mills wears it almost like an open wound. He's so, he's, he's so repressed. Um, and and the, that notion of, of his obligation that he's had since, since his birth to take this post that's been in his family and do it honor is, is weighing on him so heavily that then these other factors are coming in with Guinness's tremendous anger and resentment at his noblesse oblige and his you know sense of entitlement, that it it forms this toxic cocktail. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I just th that's why I find the movie so fascinating because to me it's so believable. Uh, it, you, you don't there's there you understand why these two characters who you know, in other circumstances might have been okay with each other, but under those circumstances, given what they're, where they are then and what, where they came from, they're going to have a deadly conflict uh, without even... No, just without that, just chime in that uh, uh, you did answer the question. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, because I could go on for an hour, for hours. No, no, it was, we asked, and the, the person who asked it says you have answered it, so that's... Thank uh, you. Spurs on there. All right, we have a couple more questions. Um, is it possible that both um, Mills and Guinness characters are failures uh, since uh, he forces the leader of his unit to commit suicide and he shames the unit and himself? So are they, I guess the, the question that it's asking is, is it possible we can see them both as failures? I don't see Mills as a failure. I see Mills as a victim. I see him as a very unlucky man who goes to a post that he thinks he's inherited at exactly the wrong time with exactly the wrong person there who's going to make it as difficult for him as possible. And he, and he is a victim. Guinness, uh, Jock Sinclair is a failure. He's a failure. But he's a failure in, in a way that you, where you sympathize because he does have this anger that he's carried his whole life that is the class struggle in Britain. And it's not a lot of working uh, class folks have it, I'm sure have had it towards uh, the, you know, the upper crust in Britain because the class divisions are just so stark there. Um, so you understand where he's coming from too, but he basically tortures Mills to death. I mean, this is, to me, there's no question about it. He's torturing him, he's, he's humiliating him, torturing him. Uh, and he's doing it because that's all that's left to him because he can't, he can't run the regiment because of, you know, where he was born. Uh, you mentioned this, uh, you just touched on it about the, the class uh, structure in Britain. So this next question is, uh, do you think that Scott's switch from his camaraderie with Sinclair to the support of his new commanding officer is persuasive? Is it motivated by class orientation or by military discipline? Uh, it's a very interesting question. I suspect a bit of both. I suspect Scott is a, uh, is a guy who likes the military because he can take orders and go along with the status quo and position himself uh, with the least fuss. 
that is a that is a very he is i mean dennis price is so good in that role he's such a scumbag excuse my language but he really he is just venomous and cold and yet there's something inside of him um where he regrets what happens but he's the one who delivers the coup de grace um and he, but he's the kind of guy who doesn't he'll cause the conflict but then he's going to run out the door before he's caught in the crossfire so what he wants to do is get along and go with the prevailing wind and get through and be left alone and have a drink and you know the, the next day comes i mean he is a this is not a courageous character and he's a weasel and uh, and yet there's a touch of humanity to him and that's why dennis price was perfect for it i'm glad people noticed that character because he he i hadn't seen the film in some time and it really hit me how good he was uh this next question is uh what do you consider alec guinness's best film how do you feel about our man in havana aha uh -huh. so now um alec guinness's best film it's like saying what's the best movie ever made um i think it's very hard to argue with either kind hearts and coronets or bridge on the river kwai but he did lots of others including this one i mean he was just so masterly in whatever he did he was such a beautiful actor he had such a beautiful voice uh he was so expressive and yet he never overacted um uh that that but those are the two that i would mention uh, i think bridge on the river kwai is a movie that you can see you know once every few months and it's a joy particularly if you see it on a big screen and kind hearts and coronets is everything that that peter sellers did in dr strangelove now he just took on all these different characters and did it you know knocked it out of the park with dennis price is the sort of the the straight man the sinister straight man that's another movie everyone should go and see again it's kind hearts and coronets uh can't do too many of these british films because we have america to think about but uh, now did i miss part of the question if so no no you you answered it well the the uh the person who asked it was putting was was voting for our man in havana so uh do you want oh our man in havana i think is good in fact i want to see it again you know it it got mixed reviews it was not a it but it was partly because the people who did it did the third man i mean the third man with orson welles and joseph cotton is and carol reed directed it same guy and that so our man in havana has always been compared to it. um and i don't think it's quite the movie the third man is but i'd like to see it again ernie kovacs i mean my god i he died about it a year after a few months after that movie was made um so i'm interested to see it again and i'm a big fan of noel cowards we mentioned him before in terms of in which we serve which was this incredible propaganda war film with john mills directed by david lean with ronald neem as the cinematographer so you know that sort of small world of the british film cinema was amazing in those days uh let's see um so this one is it's more about uh, you're talking about Britain versus America. So, uh, doesn't the conflict between Sinclair and Barrow and their personal crises reflect the post-war decline and collapse of the British Empire? Meaning, meaning that those who were on top are now in second or third place, or they've been reduced. That's a very interesting observation, and it may have a lot of merit, but I, I hadn't really thought about it. I thought about it more in terms of these are both warriors, quote unquote, in peacetime. And when you come back from war, I mean, this is supposed to take place, and I'm not sure I made this clear, but I think it's pretty clear, that we're dealing in, in the immediate post-war, World War II period. That's when this is supposed to take place. So that's the other part of this that's so fascinating, this, com this combustibility well yeah they've just been in in combat for five years and they come back and they go to their regiment you know their regimental castle and they're supposed to act like everything's normal um you know it, it's um uh, it, it's just another but that's a that's a very interesting uh point i gotta do a little more thinking on that one uh next question is do we know what david lean thought of tunes of glory uh, I don't, but I'll tell you something. I I would bet any amount of money that he liked it and admired it. I, I just would bet any amount of money. A, all his best friends were in it. B, it it it's as good as it. I mean, it's just such a good movie. 
Uh, and, and it's got a literate script. Uh, so no, I bet you Lean was a fan. And in fact, now that you mention it, I will go to my friend, our friend, Bob Harris, who's on the Playhouse board and ask him, because I bet you Bob knows uh, how David Lean felt about that movie. Uh, and Bob knows Tunes of Glory very well. So, uh, but I would be shocked if Lean had anything other than praise for it. Okay, the, uh, the next question is, um, wasn't Mills' character a failure by moving from the court martial to handling the incident internally, thereby losing any authority he might have had? That depends on how you look at it. It's funny because the book supposedly didn't have that. The book had him not bending uh, and you, that made him less sympathetic. My view of it is that Mills was trying to find a way to one last grasp at, at trying to find an accommodation where he could still keep the job and, and deal with Sinclair and that Sinclair just might be grateful to him. Well, of course, exactly the opposite. Sinclair has only contempt for him, um, which is frankly one of the reasons uh, the Sinclair character is so hateful um, because he should have been grateful. He, you know, this man is basically saying, hey, I'll give you, you know, let's work, try, I will work this out if we can, uh, you know, if we can get on with it and have, you know, and, but Mills should have been much more, uh, his character must, should have been much more assertive about saying, you know, I'm expecting things from you. Although it probably would have mattered because Sinclair had such con uh, instinctive contempt for him. And he was blinded by it. And then um, when Mills dies, it all comes crashing down and he realizes what he's done. And he realizes why he's done it. And it's, it's crushing. And he has a breakdown. I mean, he's basically having a breakdown there at the end. Uh, uh, this next one is not really a question so much as a comment that you should put the horse's mouth into the top three of Guinness's roles. Uh, you know what? I need to see that movie again. It's a really quirky movie. Um, it's kooky. He is, plays a really weird character. Dan, you know, have you seen The Horse's Mouth? I have. It's been a while, but I've seen it. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, he is, this is a very, uh, a very eccentric fellow, this painter. And uh, it's, it's sort of weird uh, humor. Um, and I didn't always get it. I mean, I, I, I sort of respected it, but it didn't just, you know, wow me. But I need to see it again. Uh, and in fact, it is in my queue. I have the, uh, the Blu-ray. I'm going to watch it. Uh, can you just uh, state one more time, uh, where was it filmed? What was the barracks and, and where it was located, where they filmed it? The uh, Scottish and Argyle Highlanders. The Stirling Castle? You mean where Tunes of Glory was filmed? Yes, where, where, was, it, where was it filmed? Exteriors uh, in Stirling Castle, interiors on a set in, you know, near London. Um, this is a good one. Uh, the United States War College sees Tunes of Glory as a modern take on a classic film about leadership. What do you think of that assessment? I think it's, I think it's a very good assessment. I, uh, and I saw it. But you, uh, a object lesson in leadership doesn't mean it's showing great leadership. It can also be showing pretty poor leadership. Um, and I think that what you're seeing here is pretty poor leadership. Or more specifically, the Mills character is unable to lead. He doesn't have the capacity to lead. And, he's, and frankly, he's not given a chance to lead. It's not like he's welcomed. Uh, but how, I, I think what they're doing is saying, what if you were a great leader and if you were strong uh, and dynamic, how would you have turned the tables on Jock Sinclair and, and instilled the discipline and followed through? And that goes back to our previous discussion about when, when he caves, when Mill's character caves, should we have contempt for him? I didn't, I, I know, I, I, I didn't, but others might. Uh, so that makes it very interesting because leadership is about, I'm taking over a, a regiment with a uh, second in command that all the men love and I have got to take control. Uh, without making this, without humiliating this man, but I have to make sure that he understands he's got to go along. That that's leadership. Anyway, my uh, what do you see uh, about connections to be made between Tunes of Glory and the Kane Mutiny? In the sense of you have a a commander who's relieved of command. 
Oh, that's a really interesting question. I hadn't even thought of those two, uh, those two movies together. The the Kane Mutiny is um, I love the Kane Mutiny, but it's a it's a much this is this is how this is big Hollywood. I mean, there's no there's no shading or subtlety uh, to the Kane Mutiny. Really, it's it's a I love the movie. Don't get me wrong, and Bogart is amazing, but. The, there's a subtlety to Tunes of Glory where, with John Mills. That's why I say he underplays it. With, with, with Queeg, Bogey and Queeg, he basically loses it on, during that typhoon. And then in the court, he loses it and really loses it. So, I mean, this, there's, no, you know, there's no way around it. He is, you know, the, I, I just, you know. So I see it as, um, yeah, I see it as the, the, the pressure of leadership or responsibility of, of, of someone who uh, has been disintegrating for a certain period of time, but this there's a there's a spark that lights the flame where they really go down. Um, and I love both movies, but one is very Hollywood, very big, and and this is very much the British way, um, which is a little bit more restrained, uh, but very interesting to compare those two films. Okay, that was uh, actually the last question we had. Um, Terrific. We want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, just uh, for those of you who are interested, we have a couple of things coming up uh, later this week. We have tomorrow night um, an author talk. Uh, Ariel Lawhon, who has written uh, the book Codename Aline, will be uh, doing a Q&A. Uh, you can get information from that on our website. And Thursday night, we are back to uh, doing trivia uh, online. So that's coming back as well. Uh, if you are um, uh, interested in these programs and you enjoy John's talks, uh, please consider visiting our website and making a donation so we can go from eventually being virtual playhouse back to being the Bedford Playhouse and seeing these films on the big screen like we were always hoping they would be. So thank you very much. Um, thanks again, John. And uh, we hope to see you in a couple of weeks for the Lady Eve. Thanks for coming, folks. Good night, everybody. Good night. Is that okay? I think you're good. We're going to end it right now. Thanks, John. Okay. <laughs>